Welcome to the student critique video for lesson eight on caricature checklists or to-do lists. The caricature checklist is basically another strategy for designing the initial idea or concept for the exaggeration. It's an alternative to uh, what we learned in the fundamental part of the course, which was drawing thumbnails. Uh, instead of drawing a thumbnail, we're gonna actually write a list, a written list of all the distinctive things that make your subject look unique and that will be our guide in drawing a rough sketch. It's sort of a time-saving device I came up with in my own workflow to help me when the thumbnail sketches just weren't cutting it. Uh, because when you're making a list, it's basically giving you a set of directives that you have to follow, and it's training you to be a better observer and a thinker about what you're actually seeing and what you want to do to the caricature to change it, to, to stretch the proportions. Now, everyone who submitted, uh, I want to thank you for all your submissions. I've seen some really great work. There's people all along the spectrum from very rudimentary to way more advanced, and it's, uh, I'm going to be talking to, you know, to lots of you today about uh, that. Uh, student critiques are just a huge part, I think, of any course because you can relate usually to what I'm saying, even if you're not the student being critiqued. Uh, a lot of people suffer from the same problems and the same uh, setbacks when they're drawing and learning something. This is actually just a preview of what the premium students are going to get. In, if you're a member of the premium course, you get access to all the student critiques. Today I'm just going to do uh, one or two. So with that, let's go ahead and get started on our first subject here. Now here's Matthew Manier, Matthew Manier's drawing of, uh, or painting, I should say, digital painting of Michael Keaton. Uh, my first impression is that really good likeness. Uh, I can tell immediately who it is. Um, and, you know, there are some good things about it. The choices are generally good, but the execution is pretty rough. Uh, it's kind of ambitious at this stage you're trying to do a digital painting of it. But, uh, you know, I think because it does, the structure needs a little bit of work. It needs to be figured out a little bit more fully. And just a general note, not related to drawing, but just the painting part of it. Um, I don't really get into too much painting discussions, but I will say I would encourage you to not sample the colors directly from the photograph. Um, I can tell that's what happened here. All the photo, uh, the, all the colors here are too photographic. I can see areas that match the tones perfectly, and they don't make a lot of sense in the painting. Uh, they're kind of jarring when you put them together in a way where you don't blend them properly or they don't have enough variation because uh, you see there's like uh, areas of just flat color it looks like say you sampled uh, the area here right above his eyebrow in the photo and you painted that over this entire area right here this sort of uh, gray ochre color and there's just all these patches of flat color around the nose uh, the forehead and this whole area is like one color essentially and it's just has this weird mishmash look it's a bit spotty you're using the colors that, and tones that are in the photo, but without enough, I think, experience painting, perhaps, to make them work. Also, it's a bad habit to get into because you'll often have to work from poorly lit photos in your professional work. Or you might have to combine five different people from five different photos into one uh, illustration. And then what do you do when all the lighting and coloring and shadows are completely different from photo to photo? Um, one might be exposed to, to like incandescent light and it's all orange and yellow and another picture might have been taken outdoors and it's very cool lighting with warm shadows. So if you just rely too much on sampling your colors digitally from the original reference photo, you're going to get yourself into trouble uh, because it's not good training and you can see the results give you sort of spotty end results and it has this really clear signature of I sampled from a photo I didn't you know mix the colors on my own we, that's the danger of working digitally I think to uh, painting digitally is that you get too used to these kind of tricks and techniques and you don't really properly learn to see value and color uh, the way you should and interpret them in your own way and your paintings look like they were sampled from photos even if you do it successfully then you've got just painting that looks too photographic in its colors and it that looks jarring too so I always enjoy paintings where artists you can tell use their own color palettes for a harmonious result so just my little rant about that let's get back to the uh, drawing let's take a look at your list and see what you came up with for your checklist an oval or balloon shaped head I can see that I might say more like an egg, uh, but yeah, balloon also works because I think it's wider at the top and narrower at the bottom the way a balloon is when it's held on a string. Uh, severe, almost angry brows or eyebrows, okay. Pursed lips, 
Yeah. Uh, the bulbous bald nose, not particularly large. I would agree with that. Uh, awesome widow's peak makes forehead appear larger. You can call it a widow's peak. It's actually just a receding hairline. Uh, but yeah, it's a very distinctive shape for him. He's always sort of had that receding hairline with just a little bit up top. Uh, not technically a widow's peak, though. Heavy brow ridge muscle. Yeah, sort of the, the brow ridge area above the eyebrows is very meaty. Uh, I mean, it might be the bone underneath, but it does look like a meaty brow. Scrunched chin. Yeah, it's sort of sunken into the face, into the neck a little bit. And he doesn't have a very strong chin in general as, uh, as just a male type. Uh, a little bit softer chin than average. Bumpy skin and jowls. Yeah, I can see where you're getting that. Uh, surprised, taken aback look. Yeah, I mean, if you want to interpret it that way, I think that's fine. Um, he looks, to me, slightly amused, maybe, and a little bit, I don't know, like he knows what's going on. Yeah, that's maybe what I, what I would interpret it. Uh, and a distinct keystone shape, and that's, uh, I guess that's the keystone shape between the uh, uh, eyebrows here, and I totally agree, that's very distinctive for him, the way his eyebrows come down uh, towards his nose. So that's uh, definitely good observations there. What I would probably just do is maybe a tracing on top of this, an abstraction, maybe to show where the structure might be improved. Okay, so let's start with the head shape and do uh, an abstraction tracing to see where the structure could be improved. Okay, so I can see uh, mostly the mouth is just a bit off, a little crooked. You can usually get away with a crooked mouth, though, because the mouth is so malleable on the face that uh, who's to say, you know, from one expression to another if the right side of the mouth isn't higher than the left. Not a big deal, but in the photo, the mouth, nose, and eyes are all pretty much aligned with each other. I think, yeah, the, the mouth on the left side might be a little higher, uh, but I'll probably tone that down a bit in... Uh, in this abstraction. So let's find the other rhythms. Uh, let's find the temple rhythm of the side of the forehead. And the brows. So I'm actually finding the rhythm of the upper part of the brow where it meets the forehead. He has a very thick, heavy brow, so I think what you've got there is pretty good. I'm just kind of following the shapes you have. And the circular rhythm of the front of the forehead will actually help us make sure those eyebrows are in the right place. I just make sure my circle is oriented around my center line of the face to make sure they're symmetrical. And I can see this brow over here is a little bit far compared to this one here, which is actually on that circular line. So that's an area where I might uh, help improve the alignment of the features. And then when I'm finding the eyes, I always try to connect them up with one another, just like the other rhythms, like the muzzle rhythm and the nasal labial rhythm. I go from one side of the face to the other to make sure both sides connect with each other visually. And the same goes with the eyes. He does have some asymmetrical eyes in this angle, uh, but I do want them to match up with one another on the face. It actually looks like it's pretty good for the upper lids. But your, your lower lid, I think, is a little bit low on the right side of the face there. Also, the eye on the right looks like it might be out to the right a little bit. It's a little too far from the nose. I think I might want to bring that in. So if here's the eye on the right. I'm just assuming that's correct. It looks correct to me. Place that. An indication in there for the irises. Yeah, I think the uh, inside corner of this eye needs to come in just a bit more.
Now, the rhythm from the septum of the nose down to the chin, that's the triangular rhythm I like to do. Since he's pursing his lips, they're coming forward off the front plane of his face a bit more than what you've got. So I'm going to actually draw this projecting out in front of the center line quite a bit to show that form of those lips as they're pushing outward from the face. So the position of the mouth is going to have to change. It's going to have to come over to the right side a little bit more. And the chin can still be receding back close to that center line. I think I'll pop out just a bit more though. Because that mentalis muscle sits on the front of the chin and that's what's puckering when that expression is being made. And here's my abstraction minus the uh, illustration underneath. Um, it's kind of always hard to see a likeness with the uh, abstraction, so I'm going to do a quick traceover of this uh, just to give it a little more finished look so we can see how uh, this facial structure ends up coming out. Okay, just dim that down so I can see the abstraction, or my lines on top of the abstraction a little better. I think I'm going to bulk up that nose just a little bit for a slightly more caricatured effect than what we lay down in the abstraction. All right, so there we go. A little bit more, um, a little better alignment of the features. Taking what you had and just building on that, caricaturing it just a little bit more than what you had, and uh, trying to fix the alignment so it could be developed more into a finished, uh, uh, finished rendering. So, yeah, this I think my own sketch here could use a little bit more refinement and development uh, to bring it out just a little bit more. Uh, perhaps my eyes could be a little smaller in this choice of exaggeration. Um, but uh, yeah, so I hope that helps you figure out how you might take yours and, and uh, move it to the next level. So there's a quick taste of one of the critiques for the uh, caricature checklist assignment. Uh, caricature checklists are a fantastic uh, thing to do no matter what stage of development you're in or what exercise you're doing. Caricature checklists help you organize your thought process before you start drawing and it's immensely valuable. 
uh, for any type of illustration work really, you should always write a list of goals of what you want to achieve, what you want to communicate, even if it's not related directly to the, uh, the facial structure. So if you'd like to get access to all of this great premium content and see the full critique video, be sure to sign up for the premium course on proco.com slash caricature and uh, you'll get a lot more content and I put the instructions in the videos into more context with uh, narrated examples and of course lots more of these student critiques. So thanks and I uh, hope to see you next time.